Okay, welcome to System Devices 1 Lecture 6B, the CPU, where we continue to look at how we can use and improve our processor. So in the previous lecture we saw how we could implement subroutines using call and return instructions. Using this mechanism we can write a block of code to implement a particular function and then pass parameters to it and return results using memory, uh, either in internal registers or external SRAM. We also saw how we could implement the call return stack, uh, where we store the return address for the subroutine using a simple stack built from a LIFO buffer. But this raises a problem. We now have the capability of implementing subroutines, but this exposes possible problems with overwriting variables stored in memory. <clears throat> so if you have a subroutine that calls another subroutine and they both want to use the same registers, they'll obviously corrupt each other's states. Equally, if you wanted to do recursion, so you have a subroutine that called itself multiple times, how do you make sure you preserve the state of the subroutine at each level of recursion? Finally, we looked at different uh, addressing modes and different instruction formats in the last lecture, so now we need to implement those in hardware. One of the simplest memory management techniques to ensure preserve a subroutine state and to manage parameters and local variables is an external stack. So we can implement that in our main memory. The stack can be allocated memory space anywhere in the memory map. So for the simple CPU version 1D, it's allocated from address FFF uh, downwards. To support the management of our stack, we have two pointers. We have the stack pointer that points to the top of the stack and we have a frame pointer that points to the parameters passed to the subroutine. Now these pointers can be stored in specific registers within the processor or they can be stored in general purpose registers and that's what we're going to do with the simple CPU version 1D. We're going to use register RD for the stack pointer and RC for the frame pointer. To control our stack we have the following instructions. We have our call and return which we saw previously but we've also got two new instructions push and pop. So the push instruction allows us to transfer a contents of the register onto the stack and the pop instruction does the opposite. It allows us to read off data from the stack uh, into a register. To show this in action, we have a simple example where we have a program that calls a function that multiplies two values together. Parameters will be passed to the function using the stack. Uh, it will also use the stack for its local variables and just to be different, it will return its result uh, using register RA. So here we have the first part of our program. We have the internal registers and our top of our external memory. First thing we do is initialize our pointers, which will be stored in RD and RC. Remember the stack pointer and the frame pointer. So we load those with their starting address. Obviously, these 8-bit values FF will be sign extended to 16-bit values. So that's why we've got FF, FF stored in each of these registers. So both pointers point to top of memory. Next thing you want to do is push some data onto the stack. So we load register RA with the data we want to store on the stack. And then we call the push instruction, which writes it to the next three memory locations. So if we go back and look at the RTL for the push instruction, you can see the stack pointer is decremented by one, moving it to the next free location, and the contents of the register is written to that memory location. So the stack pointer is decremented to FFE, and the value 10 is written to that location. Then we want to push onto the stack our next parameter, the value 50. So again, the stack pointer is decremented to the next free location, and the value is transferred onto the stack. Now we're ready to call our function. So we execute the call instruction. What that will do, again, is push onto the stack uh, the return address, so the call instruction is address 6, so it'll push onto the stack address 7, and obviously that's where it wants to jump back to. And as previously, the stack pointer is decremented to the next free location, and the value 7 is transferred to the stack. Now we jump to our multiplication function, and the first thing we want to do is preserve the frame pointer of the last, of the last stack block. For this particular example, that's not too important. Uh, obviously, it's the first subroutine recall, but if you have a subroutine that calls a subroutine, you have to make sure that each subroutine has a valid frame pointer. So we push onto the stack uh, the value stored in register RC, our frame pointer. So again, the stack pointer is decremented to the next free location and the value is stored to memory. We then copy the stack pointer into the frame pointer to align our pointers for the start of the next stack frame. Now the point thing to remember is the frame pointer now will stay fixed at this point, so it allows us to have a reference back to the parameters we previously pushed onto the stack. Uh, the stack pointer will obviously grow depending on whether we call another subroutine or push on push onto the stack other data. But the frame pointer will remain at this point, allowing us to have a known relative offset to the parameters we need. The next thing we do inside our function is to, is to reserve some space for a local variable on the stack. So we load the value 0 into register RA and then push that one. So again, the stack pointer is, is decremented to the next relocation and updated with that value. Now we start our multiplication routine. So the first thing we want to do is uh, access one of the parameters passed to that subroutine. So we know the position of our first bit of data is offset by 2 from that location. So we add 2 to our frame pointer and then read that memory location. So adding 2 to FB gives us FD and we can access the value 50 
Next we access our local variable stored on the stack and this is, this is going to be our accumulator. At the moment it's empty because it's the first time we've gone through the loop and we, and we load that value into register RB. We then add our multiplicand to the running total and store that one back out to our local variable. We then continue through our multiplication routine and again we want to access the next parameter passed to our function so again using the frame pointer we know the relative offset from that one to get to our multiplier so we add 3 to the frame pointer so you can see here so 1, 2, 3 gets us our multiplier we load that into a register we can decrement it and then store it back out to memory for later usage. We continue around this loop until obviously the multiplier gets to zero. So we jump back to the top of our program and repeat that process. So we, we load back in the multiplicand and then we load back in our running total and we load back in that running total and continue through our program. Eventually we'll get to a point where our multiplier goes to zero and we can test that obviously with a conditional jump, so jump if not zero. So we don't jump back up to the top of the program, we exit out the bottom. So now in our local variable will be stored the result of our multiplication. So we can pop that off the stack into our register and then we can increment the stack pointer freeing up this memory location. Obviously the, the data stored at the memory location hasn't been changed. We can just overwrite it the next time we push data onto the stack. Next week we can restore the old frame pointer. So that was previously uh, all left. So that will move the frame pointer back up to the top of memory. Finally, we want to return back to the main program. So we execute the return instruction. So at this stage, the stack pointer is pointing uh, to our return address. So the return instruction will read that from memory, updating the program counter and incrementing the stack pointer, freeing up that memory location. Now we've finished the return instruction. The next instruction fetched will be asked from address seven. And in this example, it will enter an infinite loop because it's got nothing else to do. Just some points to note, how the stack is implemented is very much dependent on the process's architecture. In this example, the stack grows down from the top of memory, so the stack pointer is decremented every time you push something onto the stack and increment it when you pop something off the stack. Uh, but there's no reason why the stack can't grow from the bottom of memory, so it can start at address zero and grow upwards. So every time you push something onto the stack, obviously the stack pointer will be incremented, and then when you pop off the stack, it will be decremented. So it very much depends on the particular machine you're using. Uh, for the simple CPU version 1D, obviously, uh, the first instruction executed in the program is always at address zero, so it makes sense to put it at the top of memory. Okay, quick quiz. What happens if you call a subroutine and it wants to use a register the main program is already using? So if the subroutine was to use that register, it would corrupt the state of the main program. How can you preserve that register value using the stack? Now you may want to pause the video here and have a think about that one uh, as the answer follows. So as registers are a shared resource between the subroutine and the main program, what you normally see is that as soon as you enter a subroutine, you'll, you'll push onto the stack the values of all the registers you want to use, so making a copy. Therefore, within the subroutine, you can overwrite those registers now because you've preserved their state on the stack. But you just need to remember when you leave the subroutine to pop them off to restore their original values such that when you get back to the main program, it looks like nothing's changed. So using it still a moment to implement your stack is a very convenient way of managing your, your memory. Obviously, implementing your stack using a LIFO buffer puts constraints on how deeply you can nest your subroutines, so how many subroutines can call other subroutines, uh, which can be quite limiting. But for a small processor, that's normally not a problem. Downside is we do need some additional uh, instructions, the push and the pop instruction to manage our stack, and that will have some hardware implications. Also, there's a slight processing overhead with the push and pop instructions. That delay is associated with moving data in and out of registers via the stack. Obviously for small programs, you can hard code what external memory locations are used by what subroutines or what internal registers are used for particular subroutines, which removes that communication delay. But as a general purpose solution, the stack is a, a nice way of coordinating how parameters and results are transferred between the, the main program and subroutines. Okay, in the previous lecture, we looked at adding some additional instructions. So we saw how we've expanded memory from 256 locations to 4K, and obviously the associated increase in our address bus size from 8 bits to 12 bits. We also now have our register file and register addressing modes and register indirect addressing modes. So how will these be implemented in the actual processor's hardware? One of the first changes made was to the data multiplexer. So obviously, previously we were just using 8-bit values in the simple CPU version 1A, but now we're using 8-bit immediate values, 12-bit addresses, 16-bit data values from registers and external memory. We're also using signed and unsigned representations. And that does mean we have to make a few mods to our data multiplexer. So if we have a look inside there, this is what we've got. So we have our free inputs, so our A, B and C inputs, and our output here. And we have our three control lines. So I select 0, select 1, and select 2. 
the confusing bit is probably at the top here. So this is uh, where we're doing sign extension. Uh, so if we took this example here, typically when we're doing arithmetic operations, uh, we, we're dealing with signed values. So therefore, if we've got an 8-bit immediate value stored in an instruction, we need to sign extend that to 16 bits. So we need to replicate that sign bit, the 8th the bit, bit 7. And that's what it's doing here. So you can see what we've got is what we've got here is the low byte going through unaffected through an 8-bit buffer. And we have the high 8 bits either being driven by the sign bit or if we've got unsigned values or, or if we're performing logical operations, it's added with zeros. Again, if we're using 12-bit addresses, uh, what do we do with the higher 4 bits, that higher nibble? Uh, and they're just padded with zeros here. So this input here allows us to take 12-bit addresses and pad them out to a 16-bit value to be stored in a register. We also added a new status register to record the outcome of our arithmetic and logical operations. So our status register is a 5-bit register in the control logic down the bottom here. So if you look inside there, it's basically just five flip-flops, uh, each storing uh, a particular flag. So did the last arithmetic or logical result produce a zero, a carry, an overflow if it was signed, and was it positive or negative? And we can use these to expand the instruction set with, with additional conditional jumps. Our zero test is the same as previously, but we've just expanded our NOR gate from 8 bits to 16, and that's on the output of our ALU. The positive negative test is again just done on the output of our ALU. So we look at bit 15, the most significant bit, and if it's a 1, we know it's negative, and if it's a 0, we know it's positive. In signed arithmetic to see if we generate an overflow, obviously we need to compare uh, the, the operand sign bits to the result sign bits, and that's what this circuit here does in the adder subtractor. So first we compare the two operand sign bits, if they're the same, this one here will go to 1. And then we compare this to the output of the adder subtractor unit, and if they're different, we flag an overflow. Also in our control logic, we had to add some additional decode logic for the register and register indirect instructions. So we still have our original decoder, which looks at the high nibble of each instruction. But we've also added an additional 4 to 16 one-hot decoder to look at the low nibble to decode our register and register indirect instructions. So the outputs from these decoders and the state information from the ring counter and the state of register are passed to our decode logic to generate the control signals for our processor. So that's a quick overview of the modifications we've made to the simple CPU version 1D to support these new instructions and addressing modes. But I definitely recommend that you do go through the, the IRC project for the simple CPU version 1D processor. So in this processor, we could implement the decode logic using schematics as we did previously. But to simplify this implementation, we're going to use VHDL, a hardware description language, a textual representation rather than a schematic, because it's a lot quicker to edit text rather than drawing a new schematic. So what does VHDL stand for? Well, VHDL is a double acronym. The V stands for Very High Speed Integrated Circuit, and the HDL stands for Hardware Description Language. It was commissioned by the American Defense Department in the 80s to complement their programming language, ADA. So if you're used to ADA, you'll see a lot of parallels between the two languages. Originally, it was designed as a hardware specification language rather than a designed language. So originally, it was used to help define a system's hardware specification or to model at a system level. So more as a validation tool. However, with the addition of automated synthesis tools, you could convert your VHDL description down into a gate level representation, uh, something you could actually implement on silicon. But key point to note here, as originally it was a modeling language rather than a design or implementation language, you can write VHDL that is, that is unsynthesizable. That is, you can specify a hardware circuit that ca cannot be realized in hardware. So you do have to be careful about how you do write your VHDL. You always have to keep one eye on the fact that you are actually designing hardware. You're not writing software, even though it is a textual description. And hardware description languages have become an important part of digital logic design. If you go back to the 1980s, uh, we were using PCBs to implement our system. So this is an old uh, 68,000 board. So you'd have one IC, which would be the processor. Then you've got some memory over here and some interface uh, GPIO lines and serial ports over here to build your system. So you'd build your system out of multiple ICs, all implemented on a PCB. Uh, but as we've got better at putting uh, transistors onto ICs, this whole system can be implemented on a single integrated circuit. And we saw the transition from a PCB-based design to a system on a chip design, a SOC implementation. These typically had a general purpose processor with your associated memory and interface devices and some hardwired logic, some hardware accelerators to implement your processor heavy tasks. Again, with our ability to put even more transistors uh, onto an integrated circuit, we've seen a shift from system on a chip to multiprocessor on a chip. Again, we tend to see hardware accelerators 
uh, hardwired logic being replaced with general purpose processors. So rather than designing a block of logic to perform particular processing tasks, we just replace that with, again, application specific processors, process designed for particular application domains. So as you can imagine, trying to draw this as a schematic would be impossible. So you need a more efficient way of representing your hardware. And that's what HDLs allow you to do. So going back here, working at the RTL level, the register transfer level, we can abstract away from the individual logic gates and describe what the hardware should do without actually specifying how it should be built out of logic gates. And we leave that optimization to the synthesis tools. Okay, so this definitely is not a course on VHDL. That's a module in its own right. But just to give you a quick introduction to the basics so you can modify the simple CPU version 1D processor. So VHDL is built out of design units. You have the entity, which describes the interface of the component you're trying to build, the architecture, its implementation, a configuration file, which can be used to link entities and architectures together, or it can be used to initialize components. And then we have our package, which is our library unit, uh, allows us to define functions and data types that we'll be using in our system. So to put that in context, we write a VHDL description of a simple AND gate, a 7408, your classic TTL AND gate. So for this particular chip, you can see you've got four AND gates on each uh, integrated circuit, and they're connected to individual pins. And the interface to one of these AND gates is defined in your entity. So you start off with the keyword entity, then, uh, then a user-defined name, I've just called it AND gate, uh, then it is, and then you define the ports, the, the interface. A, B, and C are user-defined pin names. A and B are inputs of type bit. A uh, bit is a predefined signal type in VHDL, uh, a Boolean one or zero and C is our output of type bit. Then we finish off with end and your user-defined name. So if we look back at our AND gate, A and B are our inputs and C is our output. So the way to think about ports A, B and C are that they're the pins of the IC. Okay, so now we've defined the interface to our hardware device. We define its architecture, its behavior, how it will operate. So we start off with the keyword architecture, then user-defined name. I've just called it AND gate arch of a particular entity, uh, so that's the previous AND gate, the, again a user-defined name, is, and the keyword begin. And here we have some VHDL syntax, which is very similar to the RTL syntax we saw previously. So the arrow sign you can read as driven by. So the output C that we've defined in the entity is driven by the input A logically ANDed with input B, ended with a semicolon. And then we finish off end followed by, again, our user-defined name for the architecture. Now, defined in the VHDL language are all your favorite uh, Boolean operators. So we've got not, and, or, xor, nand, and nor. And you can combine those together to implement your Boolean functions. Within an architecture, you can have one or more of these simple concurrent statements. So this line here is defined as a simple concurrent statement. So you can have multiple of these uh, implementing different logical gates. And you can write out Boolean functions to combine multiple uh, inputs in one line. Normally I'd recommend that the text file name is the same as your entity name because some tools use that to, to identify where a particular entity is. So within that file you just type in your entity and your architecture and you can pass that over to the IRC tools and that would implement an AND gate in your circuit. Okay, to see if that makes sense, a quick quiz. So can you write me the VHL description for this circuit? Now you can do that in a number of different ways. You could have separate files describing the behavior for an OR gate, an exclusive OR gate and an AND gate and then combine those together to produce the final circuit, or you can implement it in a single file, defining a hardware component with inputs A, B, C, and D, and output Z. You may want to pause the video now and have a think about that one, and you can compare it to my answer on the module webpage. Okay, to see if that makes sense, a quick quiz. As mentioned previously, each of these lines here is considered as a simple concurrent statement, a logic gate implementing the circuit's functionality. So in this circuit here, we have five inputs, A, B, C, D, and E, and two outputs, X and Y. And this is the VHDL description of this circuit. As you can see, we've also got an internal signal, and you represent that in VHDL uh, using the signal declaration. So between the architecture and its begin statement, you can define signals that are local to this hardware component. And we've defined a signal called temp of type bit, which will link the output of the OR gate to the input of the exclusive OR gate. And you can see that here. So the question is, are these two VHDL descriptions the same? Does it matter the order that you place these concurrent statements? Do you have to work out what temp is first before you work out what Y is? As always, you may want to pause the video here and have a think as the answer follows. This quiz highlights a key difference between software and a hardware description language. 
So in a hardware description language, you're modeling these logic gates running in parallel. Uh, so it does not make any difference what order you write the concurrent statements. It's not software. There's no sequential path through these concurrent statements. Uh, you're describing, you're just describing three things that are working in parallel. So the order you write them doesn't make any difference. Now we could implement the control logic uh, using the bit data type in VHDL, but we will actually be using the standard logic data type. Uh, the bit data type can only represent a zero or a one, which is fine for functional testing, but it doesn't really allow us to describe what is happening in the real world. For example, what happens if you were to drive a logical zero and a logical one onto a wire at the same time? Uh, using the bit data type, it has to be resolved to one or the other. But in the real world, that, that should never happen because obviously you're generating a short circuit. Uh, so you'd represent that using multi-valued logic uh, with the X to show that it's an unknown state, it's an, an illegal state, something wrong has happened in your system. Now the advantage of moving to a standard logic data type is it allows you to test the circuit in a little bit more detail. It'll give you more confidence that the simulations you see in IRC will actually work in the actual hardware. If you're working with a bit data type, it could work perfectly fine in the simulation, but not in the real world. So to use that data type, you have to use a package, a library, and that is defined in the IEEE uh, library. So the IEEE.standardlogic1164 standard. And if you include these lines in your VHDL description, it will allow you to use those data types. So I've rewritten the AND gate model to use the standard logic data types. You can see here our entity now rather than being bits, they're standard logic. The architecture doesn't actually change because as within this library, we have an AND function defined for these data types. Within ISE, we can now test to see if this VHDL model is working correctly by running it within a test bench. And a test bench is just a VHDL description where the entity is empty. Uh, what that means is that all your signals are now generated within the architecture. So there's no inputs or outputs coming into this hardware. It's all self-contained. And obviously that wouldn't be of any practical use from an implementation point of view, but it does allow us to test our hardware. So we define a test bench, so AND gate underscore TB, and then define its architecture. We define the components we'll be using. So we define our AND gate component that we've written in the AND gate file. We define the signals that we'll be using to drive data onto the pins of the AND gate, then instantiate the AND gate. Then we're linking its pins to a signal. So this now is a mapping operator. So you're mapping pin A to signal A. And obviously the this, this signal could be any name. I could call the signals X, Y, Z, for example. Then we define a complex concurrent statement. Uh, so this is what this is here. So this process does have a sequential behavior. So this process here would run in parallel with any simple concurrent statements, but within the test bench, we're using it to apply our input test cases. So you can see here, we're driving a zero onto signal A, zero onto signal B, and we're defining a high impedance load on output C. So basically means it's not connected to anything. We're applying that state for 50 nanoseconds, and then moving on to the next state. So it'll apply this input state for 50 nanoseconds and then the next and the next and next going through. And that has produced this waveform diagram here. So you can see for the first four cases, we're just going for the normal truth table. So 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And as you would expect, to generate the waveform diagram for an AND gate. Then to test the multivariable functionality, we're, we're saying, well, what would happen if one of the inputs was set to an unknown state, so to an X rather than a one or a zero? So you can see here, there we go, there's our input going to an X, an unknown state, so it'll go red, it'll change to a, to a different color. You can see whilst the B input is a zero, well, anything ended with a zero will produce a zero, even if it's unknown. Obviously, when B goes to one, the output is now dependent on what A is, and A is unknown, so the output will go unknown. Then we see what happens if we were to accidentally drive a signal onto the C output. So we set A and B to zero and, and drive a zero onto the output C. And you can see because the output would be zero, it doesn't matter that we drive a zero onto that one there. But if we try and drive a logical one onto the output C, you can see again, we get a red line indicating an unknown state because obviously the AND gate's producing a logical zero and we're trying to drive a logical one onto it. So the simulator doesn't know quite what to do. So it flags an error effectively. Uh, obviously driving two voltages onto a wire is not a good idea, it's a short circuit. You'll cause the IC to get very hot and the magic smoke will escape. We'll be looking at this VHDL implementation of the control logic in a lot more detail in the lab, but I would recommend having a look through the IRC project for the, for the simple CPU version 1D processor. So this is the top level schematic as we've seen previously in the slides. So here's our control logic controller. 
So if we push into that component, we can see uh, the decoders and the, this is the VHDL implementation. So at the top level here, it is played as a schematic symbol, but if you, again, if you push into that symbol, you will open up the text editor that describes its VHDL implementation. So as discussed, the first thing we have is the entity describing the inputs and the outputs. So here we have the three inputs from our ring counter, defining the state of the processor. Then we have the status register coming in and a bit field from the instruction. And here we have the high nibble decoded outputs. So these are the control signals from the one hot decoders for the high nibble. And we have the one hot decoder outputs for the low nibble for our register and register indirect instructions. Following those, we have the outputs. So these are our control signals going to our instruction register, our program counter, our register file, our ALU, address mux, data mux, and our external RAM. Then we get to the architecture. So these are internal signals now. So these define internal signals we're using to generate our Boolean logic. And then we just have a series of simple concurrent statements. So each one of these influence a particular function within the control logic. And you can compare those to the previous schematic implementation. For example, the instruction register enable hasn't changed. It's still exactly the same. It's just driven directly uh, from the from the fetch signal. And previously that, that was driven by a buffer in our in our schematic. So do go through these. And the key advantage of now implementing this in VHDL is just the ease of modification. Uh, drawing schematics, you know, placing components, detecting the wires can take a bit of time. And obviously, as it's now a textual description, editing this text is quite quick and easy to do. HDLs are now a fundamental part of digital logic design and used in all stages of development from high level to low level implementation. But a key thing to remember is that they are hardware description language, not a design language. They do abstract away from the underlying logic. So you've always got to be aware what resources are available in your PLD or FPGAs that you're using. It's quite easy to design some hardware that can't be implemented in a particular silicon. However, the key advantage of moving from schematic to an HDL is, you, is that it simplifies the design process. You can describe your hardware at the RTL level uh, and then allows the, the synthesis tools to implement the, the gate level realization. And obviously combined with uh, simulations allows you to verify uh, that your circuits are working correctly. And the final comment there, always remember that you're describing hardware, you're not writing software. It's very tempting sometimes just to let the tools do everything, but they, there are limitations. So just to wrap things up here, we saw how we could use a stack implemented in our external memory to simplify the process of managing memory, passing data between subroutines and the main program, and how we could implement our new instructions and addressing modes in hardware in the processor. But this is only the start of the journey. You can continue to improve the processing performance of the simple CPU by adding uh, more functional units, so perhaps a multiplier unit or a dividing unit or shifters, or additional addressing modes such as displacement addressing which all helps to reduce the number of instructions needed to implement a program. And as a general rule, the less instructions in your program, the faster it will run. Okay, I think that's where I'll end it there, and that's the end of the module.